welcome to coming home, survive and thrive in homeschooling. This is the next episode in my series, Preparing for Careers and its Politics. I am interviewing Rodney Hyde. He will tell you all about his political career before and during and after. I will leave him to give you all of those details. Suffice to say, there are plenty of other nuggets that he just generally peppers all throughout the interview, including such things as the differences between having a goal and systems to achieve in your life. What does it mean to develop a talent stack? with the point to be a well-rounded person with a lot of talents rather than simply striving to be the best. And don't compare yourself to others, but use what you've been given as gifts to people around you. He also discusses the difference between a career politician versus entering politics with life and business experience. There is a lot more I could tell you about what we talk about, but I will leave it to Rodney to tell you. I do hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. Rodney, I'm absolutely delighted to be interviewing today. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Oh, well, I feel I I wouldn't hesitate because I'm a big fan of homeschooling, and I think the kids that are being homeschooled are very blessed. And anything that I can do to help, I'll be there. Oh, thank you. For those listeners who don't know you, like especially our overseas folk, can you just introduce yourself and then move into why you became a politician and how you became a politician? Mm. Is that a good place to start? Sure. Uh, My name is Rodney Hyde. Uh, I grew up in a little town in North Canterbury, New Zealand. Uh, My father was a truck driver and my mother was a housewife, like everyone was in the 60s when I grew up. I found it very boring growing up, and I found school, looking back, especially boring and quite hateful. And I realized it's because I wasn't like the other kids, and I could see through the bullying of each other and the games that kids would play. And I found sitting in a classroom quite tedious. And I got a bit older, and all I wanted to do was to leave school and get a job driving trucks and buy a car so I could have a girlfriend. And it's funny when you think back on it, that that was my drive. I just wanted to have a girlfriend, a friend. Uh, My father said I can't drive trucks. I had to get an apprenticeship first. And I went off to the nearest place I could get apprenticeship was the North Canterbury Electric Power Board. And I walked in there by myself at 14 and said I wanted a job as an apprentice. And they explained it to me very kindly, some gentleman. And he said, but for the first year, you'll be sweeping the floor on such and such an amount each week. But if you do another year at school, that year gets deducted. And I worked out that I'd make more money driving trucks at the weekend and in the holidays than I would as an apprentice. So I thought I'll do another year at school. So I turned up to the sixth form, and I was the only one that I knew. I didn't know anyone in the sixth form. I I got quite a shock in the sixth form. And then the second shock was I went in for a test, and I failed it, or I didn't do as well. I almost failed it. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to fail. It never occurred to me. I'd never done homework in my life. I'd never looked at a textbook. So I quickly got a textbook and sat down and started reading it. And I fell in love with knowledge. And I started reading the the textbooks and summarizing them in little notebooks. And I couldn't get enough of it. And the beauty of science and mathematics just hit me. I couldn't do anything else. And discovering how flowers worked, how DNA worked, how cells worked, natural selection worked how the world around me worked, and I announced I was going to be a scientist. I worked towards going to university, and I turned up, I became an environmentalist because I read that we were running out of resources, which seemed logical to me, and that we were polluting the planet, and so all of this had to stop. And I went off to university, and oh my goodness, I just fell in love with university to be sitting in these lecture rooms where knowledge was just pouring forth from a lecturer, And you could go to this vast library and just sit there and read. And I'd go to the library when it opened and I'd be there till it shut. 
and I get annoyed because I just read. And then at the end of my, I decided that I wanted to be a molecular biologist and be Watson and Crick who uncovered the double helix. I just thought that they did. They had this moment when they were a product in a way of DNA and its evolution. And this product of DNA saw the structure and how it worked. And in that moment, they were these two sentient beings on earth that saw the secret of life. And to me, that was the most amazing thing. And I wanted to be them. But I felt the planet was being destroyed and that I had to study ecology to save the planet. And I worked driving trucks through university. And then at my final year, I got a job working for the New Zealand Forest Service that was then called on the west coast of the South Island, measuring the regeneration of trees with half a dozen other students. And it was my first job, like, working for scientists. So I was so excited by it. And I went off to this job, and I was so bitterly disappointed because no one seemed to care. Like, you're supposed to start work at, say, 8. So I'd be there at half past 7. But no one cared whether you were there at 8 or half past 8. I realise now that's what working for a government is like. And no one really cared with our results because we were showing that trees were growing back after, obviously, they were cut down. Years and years ago, trees would grow back. But no one wanted to hear that because logging had to be stopped and so there was no interest in the science of it and the scientists that we were working for were totally disillusioned and i thought i'm doing all this work at university for what and i read a james a mitch in a book called the drifters and it was about how these young hippies traveled around europe and had girlfriends and i thought that sounds like me and so i saved up my money and i left for overseas the next year and spent four years working on oil rigs and traveling on my own across the world and I came home and thought I've got to make something of myself. And so I did environmental studies, a master's degree in environmental studies. I enjoyed that. I had a, the head of department sort of mentored me. I became his favoured son. And so I stayed on at the university and taught and studied under his tutelage. And we had a falling out over Maori issues because he decided that this was the way to achieve environmentalism was to get into the treaty and marry things. This is in the 1980s. And they brought in, they employed a, a Maori man who brought in his spirits. And we were supposed to pay respects to these spirits in the lecture hall. And I refused because I said, this is a university. And it became so uncomfortable with this guy who I was the apple of his eye that I had to leave. Fortunately, I'd got interested in economics and the economics department thought that I was an economist and they picked me up for a year to fill in for an absent lecturer. And so I taught economics, which I love. And I did that for a few years and then um, I went overseas to study for a year in Montana, which I loved, and I came back. And I realized now that there had been a cult there was a cultural shift occurring in education because the students would come to me, sometimes unable to read, and I couldn't teach them because they couldn't read multiple choice questions. And that broke my heart. And then the other thing that happened was they'd say to me, I love your perspective on things. And I'd try to explain to them that I wasn't teaching them my perspective. I was teaching them how great minds had figured out how the world worked. And I thought, how dreary is it to turn up to a university and sit in a lecture hall and think you're just learning what this guy's perspective is. And I realize now that was the culture wars, what we've called the culture wars occurring, that it was all just, there's no such thing as truth or the search for truth. And I became totally disillusioned, all on my own, with teaching at university. And so I left, and I was lucky enough to pick up a job working for a very successful investment banker. I saw how corporate big corporates worked and I loved it and how successful some of the most successful entrepreneurs in New Zealand worked. At that time, I wouldn't vote in an election because I despised everything about politics. And I met Roger Douglas, who was a hero of mine because in the 1980s, he stood on principle and reformed the New Zealand economy. He decided he'd write a book and he decided he needed my help. At the same time, MMP was being promoted as a thing to happen in New Zealand. 
And I opposed it. It was my first political action, really, was to oppose MMP, and we lost. And so we got MMP in. And we'd published Roger's book, and we decided that we'd form a political party. If, we, if we're going to have MMP, we'd form a political party, and we formed the ACT Party, and I was the first president. And my intention wasn't to stand, because I thought I couldn't imagine anything more frightening or scary than being a politician. But I was helping out as president and organising. In fact, I was the only one really doing it. And then it got a bit of go on it, a bit of support. And then someone challenged me to stand. And I've always been a person that if you, if I'm scared of something, I think I should do it. And I loved that. And so I was a politician for 15 years. I was a minister. I was a leader of the ACT Party. I always felt like I was behind enemy lines, that politics was a world that was distasteful to me and full of trickery and power rather than goodness and light. And so I was always there sort of semi-observing funnily enough, not caught up in it. And I decided I was only going to do three years and get out for the sake of my soul. But people were trying to sack me. <laughs> I tended to fight back. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to go. If these people want me all to go, well, I'm not going to go. And so I ended up becoming pig-headed. And I thought, I'm just going to ride this thing in as far as I can and learn what I can. And when I eventually got sacked, by my own team because they need to replace leaders every now and then. I actually went quite happily. Since then, I've remarried. I have three young children. And I have lived a blessed life because I'm away from that rat race. And uh, But I appreciate it, and I've learned from it. And I've always been a person who loves ideas and reading. I also have wanted to be a person who could do things and be practical, and so I'm managing to do both now. Does that help? Very much. That's a great story. Mm. I'm just fascinated that it wasn't your goal to go into politics. You just kind of, through circumstances, ended up there. I'm a terrible person because I've never had a goal in my life. Other than when I was very young, I wanted to be a scientist or, you know, I wanted to do this. I am still at that stage of wondering what I'll be when I grow up. A bit late, Rodney. <laughs> I know. It's like serendipity. And I think maybe I've made a wrong path. But what I do do is I take opportunities that come my way. I enjoy working hard and I enjoy doing a good job. And I find if you do that, a lot of opportunities come your way. And I also like people, funnily enough, individually, not en masse, as in politics. Again, if you learn how to get on well with people and work well and be honest, it's a abundant universe. I like that potential juxtaposition between still that potential nagging feeling that maybe you never actually had a goal and yet you're big on opportunities. But I think it's the perfect yin and yang, really. Yes. You can have a sense of a goal, but unless you have a, a really good measure of flexibility, you, you miss these little off ramps that actually become mm. your goal was your opportunities and you live them. The cartoonist Scott Adams mm -hmm. is quite a philosopher, and he does a podcast. And one of the things he says to succeed in life is not to have goals, but to have systems. Because if you have a goal, you always fall short, and the goal becomes the point. And then you're all, even if you hit the goal, you're disappointed when you get there. Like, I'm going to get past this exam, and then you pass the exam, and think, oh, did I do all that work just to get this? It doesn't feel great. A great example is to lose weight. You can set a goal to lose 20 pounds but you won't. But if you say, I want to lose weight, and you put a system in place to change your habits, you will succeed. So you need systems. And I realize that I naturally incline towards that. So I'd have systems like I would work hard, I'd do a good job. Uh, I never saw what I was doing at any one time, the be all and end all. I was always, you know, if opportunities came my way, I'd say, yeah, let's. And then the other thing Scott Adams says is to have a talent stack, which is, it's beyond most of us to be the best in the world at one thing, to be the best violinist or the best rugby player. But we can combine things and add talents together. So in his case, he was an OK artist and an OK writer and an OK comedian. But he could put that together and become a very successful cartoonist. And I think it's very easy to start off in life and think that you need to be the best at something no you don't 
because that last little bit is almost impossible. My wife was a very good squash player, but she could only get to say number 20 in the world, not number one, and so she felt a failure. But to be number 20 in the world is a huge success. Yeah. But she did that to the exclusion of everything else to try and get there. I think that's very true, and that it's important for growing up to build a system for how you live your life, honestly, working well, being awake to opportunities, and building up your skill set. Steve Jobs, when he went to university, studied calligraphy, which is the art of writing, you know, with beautiful letters. And he said later that that, that was almost the silliest thing he could do in the modern age to study calligraphy, but it made all the difference to the PC because he developed the user interface with all the different fonts. And so there's all those funny skills that you can pick up that can have a dramatic impact on you. Everything like that should be an opportunity. One of my mistakes early in my life was if I wasn't going to be the best at something, I would give it up because you think, well, you know, I'm not going to be the best singer or the best musician, so I won't do that because I can always get a CD and play it. And I regret that because it's not the point to be the best. It's the, the point is to be a well-rounded person with a lot of talents that you can use to live a, a good quality life. So that's what I teach my kids. You know, it's not important to be the best skier or the best violinist or the best at this or the best at that. It's, it's to have the skill and the appreciation. And in fact, to be really good at something becomes a curse. Because if you're a young person growing up and you're really good at something, that becomes your thing and you get rewarded and appreciated for it. And you think this defines me because I'm a really good chess player or I'm a really good violinist. And you'll have people who will take advantage of that, coaches and parents, and they'll get bathed in the reflected glory. And then you might find that you're 19 and actually not good enough. Or worse, you find that you're 19 and you are good enough, and that's all you do ever. So I think it's good to be well-rounded and build up a lot of talents and skills because it makes you appreciate how wonderful the universe is without being too philosophical. No, it's not too philosophical because it, it, it's one of the, the parts of the homeschooling philosophy that I've talked about regularly on the podcast. So the, the, the homeschooling philosophy that we tended to follow was called the Charlotte Mason approach. Oh, yes, I'm familiar. Oh, good. Okay, well, then you'd be familiar with know a lot about a little mm. and a little about a lot which mm -hmm. to me, you you talking about that developing the yes. developing the opportunities, developing the skill set illustrates that beautifully, but it's put in a different way. And I think that's a been a, a good valuable gem we've had today. A nugget from you, Rodney. Thank you. I'll tell you another little nugget. When I was a politician, I had to sack one of my MPs. I had to sack quite a few, but one in particular I had to sack, or I felt I had to. It in, meant that I had to become an associate minister of education to take over her role. It came with responsibilities for gifted children and children with special needs. And I was mortified that I'd become a politician responsible for children with special needs because I thought, there's nothing I can do. How can I help? We've got no money. There'll just be more money for this and more money for that for these kids. And I delayed doing anything in that portfolio. And we had the Christchurch earthquakes and staff came to me and said, you're going to have to go down to Christchurch and see the special needs schools and special need kids just to see how they're getting on. And so I flew to Christchurch and we picked up a ministry official in our ministerial limo and he hops in and I said, how long have you been doing special needs? He said, for 30 years. And I thought, oh my goodness, why do you do that? Wouldn't you want to be with the kids that are going to be top scientists or top writers this is my head thinking and you're the person that got them there instead you're with kids that if they manage to go to the toilet on their own it's a huge success and then I went into the special needs classroom and they couldn't get me to leave because I loved it so much and from that moment on every hour that I could grab I would do special needs because I realized in that classroom there was more learning and more happiness than in any class I'd ever been in. 
I felt rewarded just helping. And I remember going to a school where there's a the bell went and there's a little primary school kid out in the playground dragging his body along on his arms, trying to crawl. Kids all went off, teachers all went off to the classroom, and this kid was left to fend for himself. And I watched him drag himself across the classroom, across the playground, up the stairs, across the veranda, into the classroom. His legs were useless, and pull himself up onto his chair. And inside, I just cried my eyes out. But it was a cry of not how terrible is this, but how wonderful is this? Because here was a boy who several times a day has to do that, just to sit in a chair in the classroom. And he did it day in and day out without complaint. I actually seriously thought about becoming a special needs teacher. And it's very easy to talk about success and how people look on social media and how wonderful it is and have a talent stack and all the rest of it. But it's got to be for you. And we've all got our shortcomings and our issues that we have to overcome. And it's whether we do it or not. And that boy did it. He meant more to me than the captain of the All Blacks. It was more inspiring. It was greater. It was bigger. It was better. Again, it's very important when we're talking, you know, because we tend to make things at school and for young people all about being successful. And successful can be getting across the playground, up the veranda and into your chair. You know, people talk about curveballs coming through. That has to be probably the most sparkliest, jemmy, nuggety curveball I've had in a while. Thank you. It's important to appreciate that it's looking around you and not setting your goals or achievements against others Mm -hmm. and comparing yourself to others because each of us is a gift of God. And it's very important that we use our gifts. And our gifts come in many forms. And our shortcomings and disabilities are very often our greatest gift. That is great. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. My youngest brother is severely autistic. Mm. And he's been in, you know, right from the very beginning in special needs schools and in and out of and I mean he was beyond being able to be integrated. He really is severely yes. autistic and, and and is in a uh, lives in a Christian trust residency that, that care for him. Being involved in that world and seeing the people that are working in that world too, it, it's it's like an instant mini life audit. Mm-hmm. You know, every time you see, you know, these kinds of things, it just kind of drags you back to to a spot of reality and and what you said about you know being made in the image of God, but. I think it really helps that no matter what you see a person as, whether they have special needs or or, or hugely successful in a particular career or whatever, every single one of them is made in the image of God. Treat them as such. Absolutely. And we all have a purpose. Let me go back then and head back to your talking politics and how we can apply this to homeschooling. As I had said to you earlier, I've creating a series to help homeschooling families, especially as their children move into their teens and they're starting to look at what they want to do later on in their life, how to help guide them, open opportunities, etc. during these years. Because most homeschoolers have this amazing privilege of being able to curate a curriculum, if you like, what their child does according to their strengths, their interests, without compromising basics. And it seemed to me that, especially given the state of our universities, how do you help them set up into careers and perhaps bypass the universities? So looking especially at the careers of of wanting to be in politics, how would you help a family decide sure. how to guide that? And then secondly, how would you help them guide that into bypassing it outside of the I would definitely agree with you about the universities. I would ask anyone thinking of going to university nowadays, it was the greatest thing for me because it opened my mind, not closed it. But now they close minds, not open them. So unless you have a very specific reason, a very specific purpose, it's clearly defined, I would not go near a tertiary institute. Obviously, if you want to do medicine, or become an accountant or something like that, then you go and do it, but you have that purpose clearly in mind. 
don't go off to university because you can't think of what else to do. And in fact, not going to university now I see is a big plus when I look at a CV because you think, oh, that's good. Now someone that's done something, got a view and a purpose. I would discourage any young person from thinking about becoming a politician because I think polit a politics should not be a career and should not be something that you do for work. I see politics as extremely important and it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, if you like, job. And you s learn such a lot, which I'll come to in a minute. And you see such a lot. You learn a lot about New Zealand and the world. And you learn a lot about yourself. But I always think that being a politician should be after you have lived a life and achieved. And you uh, got something to fall back on. There's nothing sadder to me than someone who's gone off to university, done a BA in politics worked as a researcher for the National Labour Party, then go into a career as an MP and spend 30 years there. That's a dreadful politician by definition because they live to be a politician rather than live to serve New Zealand. Um, so I think it's important that you understand that politics is one of service. And of course, if you're a career politician, and we can name them, you know, Helen Clark, Phil Goff, Chris Hipkins springs to mind, as compared to, say, uh, John Key, uh, Bill English was almost a career politician. People have done things and then gone into politics. Sometimes for good, sometimes you think it might be to burnish their CV and you know say I was prime minister. But if you're a, a, a career politician, then I think you lack principle. And I'd get up every day as an MP and literally affirm to myself as I'd shave because I had to shave every morning that I was prepared to die that day. I don't think many politicians can do that. And therefore, I don't think they can have principle. So I would love to go down in, a, ray, in a, a hail of bullets politically for standing up for my principles. But if I felt that this was my job and all I could do, then I don't think I could have principles because I'd have to be ducking and weaving with you know where the political wind goes. And I quite often went out of my way to take high political risks, which everyone would advise me against because I'd be a shooting star or because it would be the end of my career or whatever. And it didn't bother me because I felt it was the right thing to do. And I think that's important. Important for our politicians, important for who you are. And I always try to be upfront about what I think. So that's the first thing. But that said, it's a fascinating business politics. I wish I'd got involved in politics when I was younger because I reluctantly became a politician. And then... Someone suggested that was helping me that I had to go door knocking. And I thought, oh, that sounds like the most worst thing in the world, like knocking on people's doors and saying, oh, hello, would you like to vote for me? You know, here's my card, you know. I thought this would be terrible. And I put it off and put it off and put it off. Do you know, I love door knocking. I loved it when no one knew who I was. And I loved it when they'd open their door in amazement because they knew who I was. And you knock on that first door and you say, oh, hello, I'm Rodney Hyde and I'm standing for parliament. And oftentimes you'd get sent on your way, but sometimes people would just open up to you because they felt there was someone there that they could talk to. I learned such a lot in one street about people and situations. Amazing. I remember once knocking on a lady's door and she said, oh, you're Rodney Hyde. You used to teach me economics. And I said, yes. Did you pass? She says, no, you failed me. And I thought, oh, my God, this is terrible. She said, yes, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I wanted to do art and my parents made me do commerce and you were the one that failed me. And so I went off and did art and now I'm working for this really flash creative business and I'm doing so well, thanks to you, because you failed me. Things like that. And then people telling me their life stories. You'd knock on an old lady's door and she'd start telling you these amazing tales of years gone by because they'd open up to you because you were someone they felt they could talk to. So what I would do is if I had an interest in it, I'd go to my local MP, or if they weren't, if you like, someone you'd like to approach, you can go to a distant MP, you know, someone, if you're in a city, somewhere else, and you'd help them. I can't begin to tell you how many students have come into my world and said, I want to learn about politics. And I'd say, great. They'd start off literally stuffing envelopes and delivering them. But within a short while, they'd get to meet prime ministers and future prime ministers. And in a short while, they'd be given quite some responsibility. David Seymour was one such student that came to help. 
he's now sitting down to negotiate a government with Chris Luxon and Winston Peters. So he came to me as a university student and said, you know, I'm struggling a bit to understand why you say the things that you say. Could you sort of help me get my head around it? And I said, sure, but you, I'll do that if you deliver some envelopes for me. And so I mentored him. His campaign manager was likewise a young student that came to me to learn about politics. So I mentored both David Seymour and his campaign manager for the last election. And they spent a lot of time and very quickly became confidence. And they learned a lot about politics in a short while. So the way to do that is to go to see your local MP or a nearby MP and ask if you can help them. And they would welcome that. And you might discover like a lot did after a year or two or three or four years, or some of them helped me for years, but went on to have glittering careers or glittering lives or become mothers or fathers and other and do other things other than politics. But boy, they learned a lot about politics. Richard Preble started out at 17 helping his local MP. And he would get down and tell stories about his local MP who'd been around a long time, started out with John A. Lee, who's a figure from history. Um, Norm Douglas was his name. He was Roger Douglas's father. Richard Pebble would tear up when he'd start telling you a Norm Douglas story. And that's how he got a start at 17, because he said to his father, who was a minister, I'm thinking about going into politics. Oh, well, that's easy. Go down to your local MP, what's his name, and see if he's got any work for you. So that's what you do. And you learn more by doing than by reading or watching the news. And you'll very quickly be into the inner sanctum of politics. It's extraordinary. So just go and ask is what you're saying. Just go and volunteer and become a member. Or if you don't even have to become a member. I didn't care if someone was a member, if they would do an hour's work for me. There was one young lady who came to me and she was at university and she was a very good sportswoman and she'd broken her ankle and couldn't do her sport. And so she came in and she stuffed envelopes, take a thing, fold it, put an envelope, seal it. And she did that for a summer with her broken ankle. And we're still friends. She's an expert on analyzing politics. She was an expert on people, but she just watched what was going on and learned such a lot. Mm -hmm. So it is one of the easy things to enter in New Zealand because you'll be welcomed. They won't trust you immediately, but they quickly will. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's relatively... Well, not a lot of hurdles to, to get over. Say, no, 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 no. That's it's mm. it's the easiest profession in a way to get into. <laughs> I think it shows. Um, no, there's no hurdles. Okay, and you're a citizen, right? And you're a person, and you have immigrants come and help you. One young guy helped me for a long time while he was a student, and then helped me. And I always had him doing extremely menial tasks, and I felt very guilty about it. And when I became a minister. I said, why don't you come to Wellington and help me? And I did it as a favor. He came down to Wellington and within a week was receiving rave reviews from heads of departments and the prime minister because he was so good at what he did. He would end up negotiating with the prime minister's chief of staff on my behalf. Wow, okay. And if he said X, I knew X it was. He was fantastic. And he literally, previous to that, I regarded him as someone who could do stuff envelopes. I use that as a metaphor for, you know, the things that need to be done around the office and out on the street for a campaign. And he was top flight and he went on to have a very successful career. He was highly regarded by John Key. So, you know, you get a young boy highly regarded by the Prime Minister for his work. You can't get that any other way, can you? But right from the beginning when you took him on, well, there was no kind of like, sense of entitlement about him he was actually prepared to go and do you know the mundane so that speaks to me of uh, a character that somebody already has but in in his willingness to do what you assigned him it was honing and building that character yes so why don't you sp speak to that with with those young ones who who have have an eye for working in, in the public politics whatever What's important to develop in, in someone's character and, and as the parent overseeing the opportunities their young one gets? Well, it's the characters that homeschooling does. It's self-responsibility and it's a bit of, what's the word, get up and go, where you see a job that needs to be done, you go and do it, right? You don't wait to be told or asked. You can see that there's something that needs to be done and you find yourself doing it. 
But most importantly, it's honesty. Politics relies on a level of honesty like nothing else. And it's funny because we think of politicians as all liars and cheats, but it's actually the most honest profession I know because it totally relies on it. So you can imagine that you're a local MP and you have people coming in to help you. Well, you don't want them gabbing away that, God, when Rodney Hyde eats his food, it slobbers all down his chin. It's just gross. Or you've got no idea what I saw Rodney Hyde doing, right? That's, to me, someone who gossips like that is dishonest. They might be telling the truth, but they're not respectful. There's a, I don't know, they lack integrity. And so you have a lot of people helping you like that, but you'd never let them in on the inside because you don't trust them. And you know very quickly who you can trust and who you can't. And when they come in on the inside, you can sow them politics, warts and all, and the ups and the downs. And there's a huge thrill to that. You know, there's a huge thrill because, you know, they see MPs in tears and MPs on highs of excitement and then being trashed and the highs and the lows and the sitting around late at night eating and drinking to sort of get rid of a bad day. They're privy to that, but only if they're trusted. And it's the same in, in for politics, between politicians. There was a couple of MPs in my time who couldn't be trusted, and no one trusted them, and they could get nowhere. And every other politician could be trusted. So Helen Clark and I could work together because we could trust each other. Winston Peters and I could work together because we could trust each other. And I knew that if he gave his word or I gave my word to him, that was it. Because there's nothing else that will work. You can't do a contract. Mm -hmm. And you have all these behind-the-scenes negotiations with politicians from other sides. And you might be, you might almost be abusing, you get used to this, abusing each other or abusing each other's policies in public and debating each other. But that evening, having a heart-to-heart -heart talk and agreeing to something, I found that very hard at the start when I first turned up to Parliament. I was sitting having lunch with Michael Cullen. He said, oh, Rodney, come over and join us for lunch. Oh, my goodness, it's Michael Cullen. Oh, my oh, it's amazing. Like, oh, he could be the next Minister of Finance. And he's in right now. He sat there and had a very nice lunch, and he chatted to me. Ten minutes later, he's in the house abusing me. But that was the theatre of politics. And he and I had quite a good personal relationship. Winston and I would trust each other, even though we were often at each other's throats politically. So it's to get that level of trust. It's the least Machiavellian business I know That's right. because it wouldn't work. You know, if, if if the word goes out that an MP's word can't be trusted, that MP's toast. And it's the same for volunteer. So you need that level of integrity and honesty and trust. That is the key key requirement. And then just be happy and enjoy, enjoy the job. Mm. So you go a long way with that. And the thing is, you might have two years helping your local MP, and that's all you ever do, literally a couple of hours a week. You'd learn more about politics than if you did a PhD. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of contradictions about politics too. People think politics is about being clever with words and talking a lot. It's the opposite. Politics is about listening and being humble. And the hardest thing I had to learn were those two things in politics, to listen. Very hard to listen. And it's very hard to listen to someone who you think isn't worthwhile listening to, but you learn to. And you learn to listen to someone who you might have thought of stupid or got crazy ideas, and you find yourself interested in finding out, well, this person I don't think is very bright. I think they've got some wacky ideas. And you say to yourself, well, I'll just listen and try and find out why, because they're voters. And you learn to be the opposite of an expert. Most of the time I'd sit in my office, in my electorate office, and people would knock on my door. Oh, There's another thing that volunteers get to do, is help constituents. Someone will come, make an appointment to see you, come into your office, just walk on off the street, and they sit down and they tell you a terrible tale of woe. And you sit there and you listen to every word. And you say, well, I'm very sorry, but you know, there's, there's not anything I can do much to help you. And they said, they will say, I know. I feel so much better for having told you. That's an extraordinary thing about you learn in politics is about other people's lives and other people's jobs and other people's businesses. It's not the glitziness of the beehive or the parliament, but it's going, you know, 
being shown around a business and how it works. People are excited to show you, well, their special needs school or what they're doing in their mainstream school with special needs students. And they show it to you. And in half an hour, you are doing such a lot. That's what's amazing. And again, as a volunteer helping an MP, you'll get to see that. You'll get to see your neighborhood and your community in ways you you couldn't have foreseen. I, I took on, I had a local uh, Vietnam veteran who was suffering from PTSD. And I took him under my wing and helped him for a year or two. And once he'd got better and got the help that he needed, he became my most loyal volunteer. And he helped veterans all over New Zealand through me and through the relationship I'd built with Veterans Affairs and the minister, who was from another party. I got a great insight into military families and military life and war and battles and service through him. But at the same time, he literally could ring up the prime minister. What areas of academics would have to be balanced with that so that it makes them a caring, compassionate, good listener, but also intelligent and knowledgeable? Well, it's a great thing to have basic mathematical skills. And here I'm talking, you know, primary school. So it's great to always to be able to add and do sums in your head because funny enough, politics is a lot about numbers. And it's very, very good if you are engaged in public policy and politics to understand basic economics. And by that, I mean first year economics, to really have a good grasp of how a market economy operates and why it beats a centrally planned economy. And to know such things as decisions are made at the margin, prices are incentives, incentives matter, everything's a trade-off, there are opportunity costs. If you knew those things going into politics, you'd be ahead of 99% of MPs in your understanding. You don't need a PhD in economics. In fact, that would become a hindrance because you'd become confused and confusing. But to understand the basics, like politicians talk like there's no budget constraint, like there's an, a money tree in Wellington. And when they're there, they'll just turn on the tap. They don't understand about trade-offs. They don't understand that if you make something free, people will want a lot of it. They don't understand that if you subsidize bad behavior, you'll get more of it. They don't understand that if you can commit a crime and not suffer a penalty or have a risk of a penalty, you'll get more crime. This is Economics 101. And you're sitting there with your civil servant advisors who don't get that either because they think that public policy is about moral posturing and having a good moral position on something. So they think that it's enough to care about the poor. And if we care about the poor and give the poor lots of money, this will solve the problem. Well, that's a bit like saying, I'm going to go and build houses and you don't know how to hammer a nail. You've actually got to understand what your choices are to assist the poor and to be able to think through the consequences of a policy. And if you can't do that, you will, you're no use to anyone. And so that's what would be very important basic economics, an introductory understanding of economics, and good arithmetic skills. And of course, I'm a big believer in the ability to write. I'm not talking about writing a novel, but I'm talking about being able to write cleanly and crisply. I just think that's a basic skill for life, but I'm astonished how rare it is. So I would put a lot of effort into be able to write in a way that communicates well. And then I would also say in that same way to read fast and to comprehend what you're reading. You should be able to write a letter on behalf of a constituent in three minutes sort of thing. Bang, bang, bang. And it's beautifully clearly written. And when someone receives that letter, they know exactly what the problem is and what's needed to fix it. They are a set of really practical, almost bullet point pieces of advice for a homeschooling family. That, that They're great. Thank you. Well, well, they are, and they are the things that aren't happening in schools. You can go to school forever, mm. and you get all the moral posturing, but can't write a letter, can't do basic arithmetic, can't understand basic economics, and they're beautiful things for homeschooling. I agree with you, and I would say that for anyone, you know, any, any, anyone. So it's not like it's a special skill, it's like a people skill. I'll tell you another thing that I think is important, is to understand how privileged we all are and that you can't let your shyness and your lack of confidence get in your way of helping people. And I used to be shy. I never spoke in public until I became a university lecturer, and I was mortified at the prospect of it. I thought, how am I going to stand up in front of 400 students and talk when I know so little? 
and I read all these books about how to give a public speaking, I read one thing in one of the books which said it's terribly selfish to stand up in front of an audience and because you're embarrassed to put on a poor performance. That's selfish. That these people have come to hear you. And if you say, look, I'm terribly embarrassed, I'm just going to sit here and talk like this and not open up, you're a selfish person because they're there, right, to get the, and you've got to do your utmost to make it worthwhile to them. So don't put your little fears and insecurities out there. you just got to get rid of that, absolutely get rid of that. Another powerful thing, I, I, I get my kids to read, my oldest kids just read it. How to Win Friends and Influence People is a great book about how to interact with people, just basic rules about respecting them and learning their name and remembering their name. And nothing works better in life than how to respect a person that you meet with good manners. So that's another good skill, but also a political skill. Oh, Rodney, I have totally enjoyed listening to you and talking with you and hearing your experience and wisdom. And I think, well, I don't think, I know the homeschooling families are just going to so appreciate the time and you're generous. Oh, that's very kind. Well, I have enjoyed it immensely. I very much appreciate the homeschool network and homeschoolers everywhere. I think they're going to save us and they're the future. And if you ever need me or if there's anyone wanting to have me come on and help, they just need to let me know and I will be there. That's wonderful because I have got something I'd love to follow up with you on that. There you go. <laughs> I will be in touch, Rodney. Thank you. <laughs>